Do it. We'll, uh, we'll try to pick up some time here and, and make Greg uh, feel a little bit at ease as we head into lunch. So welcome to the first session of uh, the morning. So hopefully you all have your coffee and all that fun stuff. So we're going to talk about monitoring today. Does that sound like everyone's favorite subject? Yes, absolutely. We need to look at all the things. So the, the short story here is, uh, let me introduce myself so this context makes sense. My name's Eric Johnson. Um, I have a problem of having too many jobs all at once. I can't say no to anything. So uh, I spend about 30, 40% of my year working with the Sands Institute. I author and teach courses uh, all over the globe conveniently, which helps me you know, get out and see things outside of the great state of Iowa. Uh, mostly in the application security world. Um, I've authored secure coding classes in, on the .NET framework taught secure coding classes on various Java frameworks, uh, mobile application security. Lately, over the last few years, this whole uh, DevOps explosion onto the world has come into play. And we've spent the last two years writing a, a class on you know, how to integrate security kind of into a DevOps lifecycle model. As part of that, we have this whole cloud thing that it doesn't seem like that's gonna go away anytime soon. So we started wiring a lot of security automation into the cloud, and one of the big pieces of that is monitoring, and monitoring what's going on in production and getting feedback into the beginning of the development pipeline. So those feedback loops from production is kind of what's landing us in this monitoring discussion today. Um, I've written some static analysis tools, lots of security tools. I do security consulting, mobile tests, app pen tests, uh, various sorts of secure development lifecycle consulting engagements. That, that keeps me fairly busy in my free time along with uh, two younger children that, that keep me running around quite a bit. So that's myself in a nutshell. Uh, contact info is up on the slide at the bottom. I will put this back up towards the end so you can take your pictures and all that fun stuff. So getting to the topic of today, uh, continuous monitoring, it's called active defense in the cloud. Uh, this idea kind of popped up I was having a conversation with some folks uh, about the SANS Cloud Security Summit that ran at the end of February in San Diego. And I had signed up to present something at it and I had nothing to really talk about yet. So I was on vacation in Mexico in early February and Nick Stark, has anyone seen Nick Stark uh, speak before? Last year he blew up a computer here, which is pretty awesome. I'm not sure what he's got in store for us this year. Uh, but he sent me a message and asked me if I wanted to speak about something at the SecDSM group in February as, or late January, I think. I, I'm, I'm getting my dates mixed up. But as we were talking about what we could talk about, I said, hey, what do you think about actually talking about monitoring and, and audit logging with a cloud focus? And if I show up with this AWS environment, just sitting there nice and shiny with some vulnerable targets inside of it, letting the whole SEC DSM group hack the environment for an hour or so. And all I'm going to show on the screen is a lot of charts and pretty graphs and alerting and monitoring thresholds to see what I can see from a blue team perspective. And we'll see what the red team gets into from a red team perspective. And he said, well, that sounds awesome. Let's do that. So I spent the rest of my week in Mexico just kind of sitting by the pool building out this AWS infrastructure, which is actually kind of a feat in itself, as we were talking about in the back. If you think about how we had to do that 10 years ago, where you had to actually get on-prem servers to build this infrastructure out, and it was a couple of clicks of a button in AWS to launch some stacks and build some stuff, and I'll go through everything I set up for them over the course of the next 45 minutes or so. The first topic we'll talk about is why do we care about this whole logging and monitoring thing. Hopefully most of you appreciate the importance of this. If not, I will give you some examples as to why you should care about this. Then we'll talk about the monitoring and active defense techniques that I put in place inside of the cloud environment, kind of some traps I laid for the SEC DSM crew before they walked in the door. And then we'll talk about the engagement, the purple team event, as we'll call it, what happened. And then the last section is let's do our postmortem. So we'll kind of go through this whole incident response process over the course of the talk. So that's kind of the, uh, that's the layout. <coughs> Sound exciting? Yeah, sounds good. All right, let's rock it. Obligatory, here's the section that we're in slide, number one of four. Uh, let's talk about logging and monitoring real quick. This has been something that largely is not new to the world of information security. I would say in most organizations, this is sometimes neglected 
at the same time. Uh, evidenced by the recent inclusion, does anyone follow the OWASP top 10 lists and some things like that? Uh, was actually included in the list in the release here in the 2017 edition. And the reason is, is because your monitoring of your audit log files provides you with incredible feedback from production and gives you insight into what's happening in real time. So the idea with this is, is that a lot of us have logs. Are we actually monitoring those? And are we actually aggregating the log data to build charts and graphs and define whatever normal is and then automatically alert folks when something abnormal is going on? So that's the whole reason that this was included. And in some cases, you can take actions appropriate to defend your environment as something is going on in real time. So that's kind of the, the reason it was included. From a cloud focus, I thought to myself, well, what sort of breaches have happened in the cloud lately that could have been detected with just very basic monitoring and logging techniques? Now, there's a splattering of these on the slide here. Has anyone seen that whole, your S3 bucket is showing problem going on in the world? Yeah, so there's, there's lots of these. There's a few examples. We've got some geospatial satellite data that was in a public facing bucket. I'm sure that was classified as probably top secret information that you, know, you wouldn't want the world to know about. We've also got deep root analytics that gave away all of our voter records information. That's you know, just one of the examples. Uh, we've also got Verizon dumping a bunch of bucket data out. From a personal perspective, uh, we ran into a situation, has anybody written a Java filter before? No Java devs in here? Yeah, we've got one. What's a Java filter do? Um, yeah, you do whatever you want. Yeah. It's kind of like a mini WAF out in front of your, if from a security perspective, right? It's going to run some code on every request and every response. Absolutely. Yeah, it's very, very flexible in terms of what you can do. I've seen these used quite a bit for security features in the past. Maybe I've got an authentication or an authorization check I want to make on some application, and I'll do that before the request actually reaches the underlying core app code. Now, in one of our applications at one point, we actually had a Java filter running, and inside of it, there was this debug switch. And this was not ever supposed to be turned on. And inside of that debug switch, it logged the entire request and response data into an S3 bucket. And it was helpful you know, for debugging and development and maybe in your kind of testing environments and things like that. What do you think happens to this debug flag at some point down the line of it sitting there? In production, in a financial system that's got lots and lots of financial records, PII data. What do you think happened? Turned Somebody turned it on. And the person that turned it on was the engineer that knew that it was actually part of the filter because they wanted to troubleshoot something. Okay. What do you think they forgot to do after they left the company a couple weeks later? Turn it back off. So this filter is collecting, at, at one point, about 1.5 million records inside of it over the course of you know, several months, we'll say. Just loading data, data that is regulated, but for that matter, into this bucket. What do you think the permissions on the bucket were? <laughs> dash, dash, public, dash, read. That's the command line switch in AWS to make this mistake. Does that sound like a problem? If not for us. No. I kind of freaked out a little bit, and we've got this whole uh, realization that this is going on, and yes, you turn the filter off right away, and like, let's blow the filter away, first of all, so this never happens again. But you've got this whole problem of, do you know if anybody actually read any of the information out of the bucket? Do we have to make a report to, you know, the OCC and the SEC and the FFI, you know, all of these acronyms out there in the world that regulate the financial world and say, oops, we lost 1.5 million records? That's the question. 
What feature on that bucket do you think saved us from actually having to do that? Audit logging, right? We actually had logging available. We knew from an auditing perspective that there was not one single read operation against a single item inside of that bucket, which saved us a pretty big headache. So that gets down to the underlying topic that we're talking about today, which is auditing and monitoring of all of our things. So that's just one example. And yes, we deleted the bucket pretty quick afterwards as well. Let's talk about another example. Now this would never happen in real life, but let's say that hypothetically, there was some sort of struts vulnerability that allowed you to get remote code execution on some sort of a server on the internet. And let's just say that that server potentially had access to 140 million social security numbers and credit data for all of the people in this room, most likely. Again, just pretend that this, you know, maybe happened in real life. That's not the same group, is it? Yeah, you're on, you're on it there. So let's talk about monitoring in this scenario. What they did, they popped the app server, the web box sitting in the DMZ. Big deal. That's going to happen to lots of web servers out on the internet. So think about this from an auditing and a monitoring perspective. When they use that web box as a proxy and they pivoted back into the internal server, whether it was a database or a web service or whatever, and they queried 140 million records out of that backend system, do you think that that activity maybe would have been flagged as abnormal? taking on that many requests in a very short period of time? It seems like that would be an anomaly to me. If you average 200,000 requests a day and suddenly you're getting 10 million requests over that, let's just say, 14-day time span, how does no one notice that? Gets back to monitoring, logging, alerting, looking for anomalies kind of taking this concept that we're talking about here and <laughs> we'll keep going here. Is, is there a person or is it an animal? I don't know. I'm <laughs> so back to the not Equifax situation. There's another aspect that I looked into and said, when this struts vulnerability is actually exploited, do you think that ends up in an Apache log file? Has anybody looked at what exception that throws? So it's an invalid content type exception is what gets logged in your Apache log files. So again, from a monitoring and logging perspective, we had two chances to detect this. One was the abnormal 140 million requests to the backend server. The other one is more of a needle in the haystack. Did you realize that you had this invalid content type exception drop into the Apache log file? And then did you have alerting on that to be notified that yes, somebody just popped your vulnerable struts installation? So a couple different things to take a look at there from a monitoring perspective that could have stopped this Maybe, bef maybe they get 100,000 records or 200,000 records out, but it's not 140 million. So the blast radius could be much smaller just based on simple auditing, monitoring, and logging. All right, what do they have in common? Now, we've talked about a lot of this already. We've got missing monitoring and logging facilities that could have minimized the actual problem. What do you think? <laughs> now someone is climbing through the rafters up there. <laughs> um, the other problem is if you are logging, the security teams truly may not actually know where the log files are. So we're just talking about sims a little bit in our context. And it's like, yeah, you might have this very big, fancy Splunk installation that's costing you tons and tons of money. But the data that you need to detect these things is not actually in the SIM system. So that's another problem. Another one is that we've got no automated way to aggregate the information and make it visible to folks. So you can see that anomaly happen in real time. So let's talk about active defense a little bit. 
Now, who's seen some of the talks out there where it's like active defense means that I get to go hack, at, hack back against all of my adversaries out there in the world? Has anybody seen anything related to that? It turns out you're not actually supposed to do that. Is everyone aware of that? Now, some countries don't have those laws. Ours does. So you can't just go hack back against them and say, well, they attack me first. So when looking for a definition, what is active defense actually supposed to be doing? I stumbled into Robert M. Lee. Has anybody seen Robert Lee speak? He's a Dragos security. He's a big ICS security guru. And he's got a white paper in the reading room at Sands that basically says, here's what it is. It's your analysts monitoring and responding to and learning from networks or knowledge of the threats internal to your network. And internal is the big key word there. So you can take responses, but you can only change things inside of your running network. So that's the big key word, the big takeaway there. So what does that mean? You have to know where all of your things are in order to actually defend them. And you have to know where all of the audit log data associated with them is as well. So in the cloud world, this is actually kind of difficult. Does anybody work in AWS and or Azure on a regular basis? Does anybody really thoroughly think that uh, all of their auditing and logging facilities are easy to understand where everything is going? So in this environment that I'll introduce you to, I ended up with four primary places that I had to go look for log data. Most of my flow log data is in this VPC flow log area within CloudWatch. CloudFront has its own set of distribution logs that are piped out into an S3 bucket. Then we've got our ALB, your load balancer information, also ends up in, oh, that's a different bucket. You have to go look in that other place to find that thing. And then you've got your app server logs. So we've got potentially an Apache, an Nginx server. We've got log files there. And then we've got a bunch of Docker containers running. And then those have log files inside of them that you have to go peel out of the Docker container and get them back out into some other place that you can go look at it. And now you start to think, well, it's a no wonder that people can't monitor and log any of their information, find it, respond, attack, defend, et cetera, because we don't know where to go look for these things. So I'll take you through a quick journey here of what we dug into. VPC flow log data is similar to NetFlow kind of on your on-prem networks uh, from a logging perspective. They're not as in-depth though. We've asked AWS over and over to give us more insight and more visibility here, but you get some aggregated data. So there's four examples on the slide. You've got your source, your destination IPs, source, destination ports. You've got some aggregate, how many bytes were in the packet and what log status was it accept, was it reject? Those are the kinds of uh, bits you're going to get out of that log file. So you've got to go into CloudWatch to find that. And that's where you can dig that information out of. Moving down the stack. So we set up in the environment some CloudFront distributions. So we've got CloudFront log files that are stored in an S3 bucket as compressed text. So you've got to then go pull the GZ file out of the S3 bucket and then extract the GZ file to find the actual log data. So that's another place you've got to go look. And in here, you've got some TLS protocol info. You've got what endpoint did the individual try to get to, what the response code was, what the user agent was, some good diagnostic information that you can use to identify some anomalies. Digging into your load balancers. Oh yeah, we've got to go look in a different S3 bucket here more compressed text, more unzipping. We can go in and grab URLs, you can grab user agents, you can get some of your TLS cipher info, the response codes, again, similar information, yet it's in a different place. Then you've got your app server logs, which the big bold word on the slide is really important here. If you don't do anything, these are ephemeral log files. How many times do you think Netflix rolls over their instances in a one-day period? Has anybody ever thought about that before? The average Netflix instance lives for about an hour. So they've got ephemeral log files that are sitting there, maybe in Apache or whatever their server is, that if you roll the instance over, guess what happens to your log file? You just wave by to it, right? It's gone. So your forensics data has to be extracted out into some other area. 
So you can install agents on your instance to get that data into CloudWatch. This becomes even more complicated when you actually put it inside of a Docker container because now there's other extractions that you have to do to get that working. But the idea with this is same sort of log information. You need the information, you need the response codes, you need the endpoints, you need the IP addresses that are making these requests in order to turn them into actionable intelligence. So that's kind of where we're heading here. How many of you are just excited to start this process and build all of your metrics up? One person says yes. Two, so there's a project out there. If you're wondering, okay, you've given me a couple of examples, but how do I really get started here? The project name is actually very appropriately named. It's called Monitoring Sucks. And it's a Git organization. So you go into GitHub, go to the Monitoring Sucks organization, and they've got seven or eight different repositories that are geared towards helping you build your active defense techniques just by gathering log data and monitoring for certain events. So some examples. There's one repository called Tools. Here's all of the different auditing and logging and monitoring tools that you can use to help you track this stuff. So it'll talk about using StatsD, which is open source from Etsy, Grafana and Graphite, which are open source kind of metrics gathering tools. It'll go into using CloudWatch, maybe using your Elk Stack and your Kibana dashboards. It gives you all the different tool chains out there to help you figure out where to get started here. There's also a bunch of blog posts. There's tons of references to Etsy's Code is Craft blog, where they've gone through how they built their entire DevSecOps monitoring around this concept. So they've got lots of examples out there. And then there's just a metrics catalog. Here's an example. There's tons of metrics. Well, which port, which service are you trying to monitor? Here's an example of port 80. Okay, if you're on port 80, make sure that you actually monitor your duration connection, how long it took, the request bytes, the response code. It tells you all the data that you should be logging. And you can go through that for your network infrastructure, for your databases, your web servers, your message queues, lots and lots of services in that repo that can to help you see if you're tracking at least everything that you should be tracking. So that's step one. Now you've got the data and you can start turning them into meaningful security metrics. And this is where charts and graphs enter the picture and it gets really, really exciting. So let's just play a game here. If you get a spike of 404 errors and put your security hat on and think about it, yeah, somebody might just be trying to go to a page that doesn't exist. So if you average a thousand of those a day on a system and then suddenly you see 10,000 404 errors in 10 minutes. What's going on on your system right now? Scanning. Scanning, yeah. Somebody's probably running Durbuster against your site looking for evil admin interfaces like my PHP admin or WP-admin looking for common exposed admin interfaces, things like that. So you could detect that in real time just by monitoring normal versus an anomaly. How about 500 errors? Same game. What's going on if you're seeing a bunch of 500 errors? Yeah, somebody could be running injection style payloads against your site and actually causing SQL exceptions or some sort of command injection style error to occur, which is going to be just a normal 500 error. So you can start to detect those in real time. If you get a bunch of user agent headers in your logs from Nikto or W3AF or SQL map or some sort of very commonly known scanning header, some script kitty is probably just bored and running W3AF against your system. These are all signatures that you should be picking up on pretty much within the minute to five minute window that it starts. You should be being alerted about it. That's the active defense side. Some challenges here. I just showed you a whole bunch of different log files with a whole bunch of different information. It is hard to actually process this, especially in large scale enterprise. Usually you've got to aggregate this into one centralized system. Splunk is probably, I would say, by far and away the most commonly used kind of enterprise level tool for this. Has anyone just used the Elk stack to ingest all of this information into something like a Kibana dashboard? 
So Phil Hagen is a SANS instructor that runs uh, around in the forensics curriculum. If you're looking for completely free open source, kind of similar to Splunk, you can check out his virtual machine. It's called Sof Elk, S-O-F-E-L-K. It's an open source virtual machine with all of the data ingestion tools you could ever possibly imagine, pre-built, pre-configured, ready to roll on it. All you have to do is download the VM, turn it on, and start putting data inside of it. It's got the dashboards pre-configured on it, and you can use those to kind of customize and build out your own dashboards. That's a great rolling distribution for a virtual machine to just get started here. To make up for the fact that we've got this overloaded kind of information that, that we can't really process from a human perspective. Now, I mentioned the needle in the haystack. Let's talk about that uh, invalid content type exception from the struts breach. How many of you are going to dig through your Apache log files and notice that one line out of 10 million in the log file? Unless you are incredibly good at reading log files, which I don't know a single human that loves to do that and is good at it. Uh, let's just say that we probably aren't going to see that because humans don't have the time or the attention span to, to locate that needle in a haystack. So that's another problem. So what's the solution to make up for us not being able to process these? Here's your answer. Take the data and convert them into meaningful dashboards. If we had a dashboard in our hypothetical organization that got beat up by the struts vulnerability and they had some sort of a dashboard that was looking for the number of invalid content type exception errors, which there should be very few on that endpoint that was vulnerable to that. And you saw one thing pop up, is that maybe worth looking into? And if something shows up on the dashboard and you automatically fired a Slack message off to the security team that said, you need to look at this right now and see what's going on on that box, would that maybe be an appropriate way to respond to that metric? None of that happens if you don't have visibility into it. There are tons of graphing utilities out there. On the slide, some examples. These are some of the charts that I snapshotted during our purple team exercise where I said, wow, look, there's a tremendous spike in requests going in through CloudFront. That just pretty much told me that I went from my normal activity to I have lots of people attacking the environment right now. My WAF that I set up suddenly was only blocking 10 requests a day. Now it's blocking hundreds and hundreds per every five minute chunk. Does that maybe give you some actionable intelligence that yes, something is going on inside of the infrastructure? Absolutely. So we can set a lot of those things up and then use them to drive some of the automated responses to what we might want to do if some of these events actually happen. So one of my students in my class told me about what they do at one of their, it's a ticket exchange, and I'm not exactly sure which one, so just pretend it's like Ticketmaster, for example. So it's, pretend it's Monday morning, it's 10 a.m., we're just releasing a batch of tickets to this concert. What do all of the scalpers do at that moment, right at 10 a.m. Right, we want automated purchasing to go snatch all of the tickets out of there so then they can go resell them. This company has very good automation detection built into their system. And yes, the very first, you know, let's say most simple step one thing they could have done is just kind of blacklisted their IP address and blocked them out of the system temporarily. But is that going to stop them? No, because they can easily just hop on to a different, let's just say, network, change their IP address, hop on a tour, whatever, rotate their IP, and now they're back into the system, right? So instead of doing that, they're using more of a honey trap style methodology where they actually feed them over into this environment that's not the real environment. It's almost like a playground that has no actual bearing on what's going on in production, and they let them try to purchase tickets. And they send them to that screen that actually says, we're letting you, remember the one that says searching for available tickets and it just kind of sits there and lets that wheel spin for 20 minutes before they're like, man, this thing's broken. Something's going on here. That's active defense, right? They're having them go waste their time on something worthless. Meanwhile, the rest of us normal users are using the existing system like nothing else is actually happening. So just a very good example of kind of where it gets exciting. Use your imagination. 
So when I looked at automation for the blue team exercise, I said, what can I do internal to this fake network all set up? And I said, well, we can block IP addresses. That's really easy to do with the AWS WAF. I didn't get to the point where I got functions in the environment to redirect them to an alternate location. So that could be something we could do down the road, kind of following the Ticketmaster example. Have any of you played with the AWS WAF before? This is inside of the environment. It's not something that you have to go grab from F5. It's actually incredibly cheap at a lower scale, and I'll get into some of the costs and what it does, but it automatically protects a lot of your cloud content and also injects a lot of automation for you to react to events that are going on in the environment. This sounds pretty awesome, right? So let's take a look at this a little bit closer. Here's what we got. They have, AWS Labs, has a cloud formation automation environment in GitHub. You download it, you launch the stack, you turn it on and out of the box, you block SQL injection attacks. You're blocking cross-site scripting attacks. You've got managed IP lists. So coming out of your reputations like Spam House, the emerging threats, Tor exit nodes, those IP lists are being parsed every hour and being backfilled into your firewall for you. So you just automatically know all of the different bad actors that are out there and you're blocking them from getting to your resources just by turning this thing on. There's flood protection involved. So if somebody goes and runs an in-map scan against your environment, which Jared McLaren I don't think is in here, he's probably back in the CCF. When I set this environment up, I had him kind of play around in it for a little bit just to see if things were working. Within five minutes, he texts me back and says, your WAF hates me. All I did was run in-map and now I'm blacklisted from the entire environment. I can't get into anything. That's built into it just by turning it on. We've got a honeypot URL built into it, which I will get into here in a moment. The GitHub repo is on the slide. You can go pull this down and you can play with it whenever you have a moment. It takes about 10 minutes to launch into an environment and protect anything that you've got running behind either a load balancer or behind a CloudFront distribution. So it doesn't just work on AWS, it works on AWS. Uh, this is specific to AWS. Technically, you could protect a backend web server with it if you proxied through an AWS CloudFront distribution. So CloudFront has the ability to have a any server in the world as its origin behind it. So you could have CloudFront point to an on-prem web server if you wanted to. You would just need to make sure that I can't skirt around the distribution to your web server. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, but it, it is possible in theory. I haven't seen it used in that context a whole lot, but mostly geared towards AWS resources. So here's the diagram on the slide. It might be kind of hard to read. There's a lot going on there, but that diagram explains we've got your load balancer, your distribution, all of the log data from the load balancer or the distribution is fed into an S3 bucket, which will then parse a little bit later. We've also got all of the WAF rules being auto applied. So if you get a request parameter and it's got some injection style payload in it that hits one of the cross-site scripting or SQL injection rules, you just get blocked right out of the gate. We've also got the scanners. So we've got Lambda functions that will auto install and they will parse the log files and say, did somebody just hit this site 100,000 times in the last minute, for example? And if you did, it'll automatically take the IP address from the log files and it will blacklist it so you can't play anymore. So it'll pretty much kick you out within a minute, we'll say. We've also got the Lambda function that is pretty much just a honeypot endpoint. So let's talk about the honeypot endpoints for a minute because this is my favorite feature of the entire thing. It creates an API gateway endpoint, just some random URL. And if you go to it, it auto blacklists your IP address. Sounds kind of fun, right? And then what you can do is you can embed that out in your site. So it has you add maybe in the footer of your site an anchor tag with a no follow directive on it. So none of the automated crawlers will hit it that just goes to that endpoint. What bots are going to hit that? A lot of the app spiders that are out there, if they're trying to enumerate all of your resources, will just auto request, request that IP address and guess what happens to your system the second that you request it? 
you're out. You've got to go rotate your IP address. What I usually do is alias this as something a little more enticing. So I'll have domain.com slash super admin interface as the URL to make it look like it's something really important that I'm trying to hide from the world. And that's what will blacklist the IP address. You can also take that endpoint and drop it off into your robots.txt file and put a disallow tag on it. Because what do attackers do pretty much as the very first step in their recon? They're going to look in the robots.txt file and say, hey, what does Eric not want me to see in this website? No, there's super admin interface. Let me browse to that and see what's going on. And then they're just automatically kicked out. They can't play anymore. So now we're getting into some of these automated techniques. Here's the mandatory AWS diagram that explains what's going on here. But essentially, you hit the endpoint. It passes it to the gateway, which hits the Lambda function. And all the Lambda function does is just say, What's your IP address? And it adds you to the blacklist table inside of the WAF. So you can't get back into the system anymore, which is pretty fun. To do this, how many of you love to write code? A couple hands. You'll love this stuff because it's really easy. If you don't, if you're on the security team and you've been thrown into this operational kind of monitoring role and you don't have a lot of dev experience, just go snag somebody from the software engineering team and say, hey, I have this cool idea. Can you help me? And they'll say, why, well, yes, I can. I'm great at whatever language you've got, Python, Node, C Sharp, Java, Go, et cetera. And they'll write up this function or something very similar to it to help you automate defenses in about 200 lines of code. This is inside of the Lambda function that rolls out along with the WAF. It just grabs the IP address. It says, am I looking at a WAF regional, which is your ALB, or a WAF global, which is CloudFront? And it says, okay, let's go ahead and just stand up that AWS API and we'll just add the IP address into the appropriate blacklist rule. That's how simple this can be in the world of serverless automation anyway. Should we turn it on and see what it looks like? Yeah, well, why not, right? That's what we're here for. So here's the environment. So I sat down there in Cabo and I said, let's just stand this up. What do I want to give the SecDSM group to play with here? And I wanted to use something fairly real world because I know there are probably millions of people that have launched the PCI DSS starter template into their AWS account and said PCI is definitely secure so I don't have to worry about anything going on inside of it. Okay, so we'll test this out. I then launched a very popular WordPress stack because, you know, that's powering a very large percentage of the internet, I would say at this point and, and just said, we'll see what happens to this thing. And then I took one more step and I said, there's this vulnerable target. Has anyone used the more modern single page vulnerable OWASP app? It's called the Juice Shop. It just sells like orange juice on the market. There was a talk here last year. About it. Yeah, so it's, a, it's actually a great application if you want to practice vulnerabilities and exploitation and all that fun stuff. And I said, we'll throw this out there on the internet. What could go wrong? So I launched all of those. I did modify some of the quick starter templates to kind of scale down and turn some things off. Uh, you know, it's launching like T2 extra large instances out of the gate. I scaled those back to smalls and mediums so I could at least have pen test permission on them but not get charged a boatload of money in the couple of weeks that were there. So my updates are on my GitHub repo that was on the last slide. Uh, what we got out of the box, here's what PCI does for you. Here's a management subnet or management VPC, sorry. The management VPC is intended to have some of your aggregates, let's just say your Jenkins servers, your Kibana dashboards, all of the kind of management, non-application application related resources inside of your account sitting in there. You get a jump box, a bastion host set up for you out of the box. So you can go to this box and then that's how you can pivot back into all of the things behind it. So that jump box is a very common target right out of the gate. And I didn't touch anything. All I did was launch it with a key and I just let it sit there. And then I gave the key to Nick Stark and a couple other people so they could go in and try to add a couple of interesting things to find to the environment and that's it. So we've got that sitting there. Logging and monitoring is included if you enable it in the PCI starter set, so that's good. So we've got a lot of metrics that you can then graph. Then we've got our WordPress stack. So I launched the WordPress stack I peered the management subnet to the app subnet that contains WordPress. 
so we can actually connect to those instances and administer them if needed. And I did that so if somebody popped the jump box that they could pivot back into some more important information. And this actually launched a pretty redundant environment. So you can see we've got a load balancer that scales across a couple of availability zones. We've got the app server that's in a different subnet that's also scaled. We've also got the databases scaled as redundant reader writers and failovers are set up. So we've got a pretty redundant WordPress environment all going through an ALB. As far as the juice shop goes, we've also got, this is me just dropping things in there, a couple new instances, we'll scale those with a uh, CloudFront distribution and just spin them up in a Docker container real quick so we can actually target those and, and see what goes on inside of here. So I launched it into the world. I had to get AWS permission to actually run the simulated event here. So if you do this back in your own organization, I learned a, a valuable lesson here is this is not technically a pen test. Pen test is two days lead time. So of course at the 11th hour on Monday night, I said, oh, hey, I've got this thing coming up on Thursday. Can you approve this? And they said, oh, that's a simulated event, Eric. We need seven days lead time for that. And I kind of said, well, I've got a problem here. Uh, it's gonna happen on Thursday, most likely, regardless of your response. So it'd be nice if you could just push this through for me, which they did. So just FYI, if you decide to take this back and do this in your organization, and then we show up Thursday night. So the SecDSM crew, as it turns out, it, it, has anybody participated in any of these CTFs with them you know, over the course of the last couple of years? You all are pretty good at this. So I put some of your accolades on the slide here, and I probably missed some. This was just a small subset of all of the different CTFs that have been won by that group. So I knew that I had some nice attackers targeting the environment, and we just set you free on it for an hour. And this is kind of where the SEC DSM talk ended. We didn't write the last piece of the story yet. So let's take a look at what actually happened during the event. This is where it gets kind of entertaining. Here's the environment that started. I made this, I spent a lot of time writing up this really pretty WordPress page that had a logo and everything. And I said, hey, this is the monitoring sucks environment. Here's what I've got set up. Here's your IP addresses. Here's the web servers and all of these fun things. And then I put some dashboards up on the screen. Now we can see as far as the blue team wins. Okay, what did I see that actually helped me identify attacks that are in progress? You'll notice the massive spike in the reject packets in the flow log data. So we've got this dashboard. It averages out. Now I was getting about 30 rejects a minute just with it sitting on the internet for two weeks. And then suddenly that spikes to 77,300 rejects per minute during the exercise. So I'd say that's some pretty good uh, kind of indicators of attack, we'll call it, that something bad is going on there. So alerting, yes, it's telling me. I'm getting spammed because I set it up to an email address in this inbox saying there's bad stuff going on here, Eric. Something is happening. So that's blue team win number one. And then we'll look at our WordPress dashboard. So I set up a couple of really quick dashboards on the WordPress instance and said, okay, we've got requests coming in. We're averaging 422 a minute, which is actually kind of a lot of traffic if you think about just some website that the world wasn't supposed to know about, that someone obviously was finding it through just regular scanning. And that goes up to 6,850 requests a minute. Number of 500 errors, those are kind of important, right? Number of 500 errors goes from two a minute to 107 a minute. That's a pretty sharp incline in 500 errors. So again, I'm seeing scanners, as you mentioned, injection attempts or things causing errors entering the system very easily and very quickly through just the monitoring techniques. So blue team win, right? We're in pretty good shape here. I'm starting to feel good. I'm getting a false sense of confidence at this point. Let's take a look at the juice application. All right, so we've got request count going from 50 to 3,500 a minute. So people obviously scanning them. Four and 500 error rates are just sharply spiking on there, which is good because there's lots of vulnerabilities in that. And yet I see the, the WAF metric graph sitting right next to it. The WAF is blocking five requests per minute, and that spikes to 920 blocks per minute pretty quickly. And this is within probably two minutes of the exercise starting. The very next thing that happens is I start getting complaints. Eric, the web page is unavailable. My WAF actually kicked in, 
saw the bad IP address that was originating scans from it and triggered the Lambda function, which blacklisted the IP, and I blocked them and says, hey, the request is now being blocked by CloudFront. That's a blue team win. The bad part is that all of us sitting in the same building were actually using the same IP address. So actually, the entire room could no longer get to any of the resources. That's still a win, right? At this point, I'm like, yep, yeah, my work here is done. I'm out. You guys have to go to the bar across the street and start attacking it from over there. So we opened it up. I opened up the IP address. I put it in. There's a whitelist filter that's in there. So you can actually test things from your own machine or from your management box or wherever. Another blue team win. This could have been all Slack notifications or hip chat messages or whatever. This is just an inbox that I set up that was just spammed with alerts indicating all of these evil things going on. That's what should have been happening in the struts example. We are violating all of these thresholds. Something bad is going on. Someone needs to go look at this. And that's kind of where the blue team part stops. As soon as I opened up the IP address, we had some problems come into play here. Now, it turns out that WordPress is not very secure. <laughs> When I launched the stack, I purposely launched the oldest version of WordPress that I could launch that was supported by the stack. So it was probably minus six on the version scale for WordPress. One interesting thing that I learned is that the WAF, and I still don't know why, does not block WP scans against the WordPress instance. So very quickly, we could get diagnostic data. We're enumerating the WordPress plugins, and you can see, had I installed some vulnerable plugins, the the instance itself is completely toast at that point. So that's a problem. On the screen, you can see a netcat command that ran off of one of Tom Pohl's servers out there. He probably has these scattered across the world, I would guess. But this is just one of them. So Tom finds a shell that I buried into the WordPress app called happiness.php is what I named it. And it's just sitting there in the root. It's got a PHP shell console sitting there and very quickly has shell on the actual WordPress instance, which I think we all have to just assume that this will happen to your WordPress box if you have one of these at some point during the lifetime of it. So the question is, can we detect this and can we block it? And it also turns out that WordPress out of the box does a terrible job of doing secrets management. The database credentials are stored in the W config.php file right there in the web root with the clear text database creds just sitting there. So what do you think Tom did first when he got access to this? Well, let's connect to the database and see if I can connect to it. So Tom connects to the database, very quickly dumps the tables and then just runs a very simple command called drop database WordPress semicolon and now you're looking at the home page of the site. So database down. Legit, right? That's fair game. We learned very quickly here that that database account launched by the WordPress stack that's running probably millions of WordPress instances around the world has a really terrible database permission policy set up on it by default. Is there any reason the web instance needs permissions to drop the database? I'm just going to go on a limb and say no. So that's something we learned pretty quick. Tom continues to pillage. This is the home page about five minutes after that, where he just moves the shell up to the root of the website. So now you go to it, and the home page is back up, except it gives you an actual command shell box, and he put his mugshot on there. So meet Tom. He's back in the CTF room if you want to go shake his hand and give him congrats on a job well done with just completely breaking this in a very short period of time. It's quite impressive. So I would say WordPress itself, we've proven that you know, there's a reason that these get it popped all of the time. Opportunities. So opportunities, uh, WordPress is a special beast here. You have to monitor these a little bit closer than let's just say the three hours of dashboards I spent putting together to stand up monitoring on that instance. I would highly recommend figuring out why WP scan didn't trip the WAF because you have to be able to detect and block those if you're running WordPress out in the world. So that would be my number one takeaway to stop this from happening. 
Obviously, uh, secrets management might be something that you should also address because if you pop the web box, you should not be able to drop the database. So shifting those creds off into some sort of secrets management vault, whether it's the AWS vault, parameter store, HashiCorp's vault, who cares which one you use, getting them out of the clear text file at rest on the disk is a, also a very big takeaway that would need to happen. Uh, let's see. I learned very quickly, I didn't have any dashboards on my database connections because I never really thought that far down the line that the database would just drop mysteriously somehow. So that would almost be like a reverse dashboard where if you're averaging 100 database requests per minute and then suddenly it drops to zero, that might indicate a problem. So that was a dashboard that just wasn't even in the equation when I started. Uh, we've also got the, the juice shop application. So on that side, nobody told me or at least sent me screenshots of anything bad that happened to that app. And it's probably because everyone was banging against WordPress and we didn't have that much time to really crack into that one. But the audit log data from inside the Docker container, now I launched it with the log driver for Docker that was supposed to pipe the information out to CloudWatch for me. And it never arrived. So Getting the log files out of the container is a challenge, something that you're going to have to address, especially if you're in a containerized environment. Uh, let's see, what else did I put on here? Uh, from the PCI side, I was missing some information just in the log data for the PCI stack alone. Uh, we had, by default, no VPC flow data inside of the management stack. The app stack had it. But that management subnet, you know, the one that is responsible for handling all administrative items and connections inbound to your environment, had no flow log information available. That is a big whiff on the template side. Maybe I didn't turn it on. I haven't gone back to look at it yet, but something that would need to be addressed. There's also no logging on the SSH side on the Bastion or the Jumpbox host. So you should be able to see if you're on uh, boarding a bunch of failed SSH connections. That should be a chart and an event that gets triggered. Also monitoring successful logins to that instance. Tom's egress connection on port 2222 may have also been something you could have blocked with a standard NACL and or security group rule on the kind of instance level WordPress side. So outbound allow star kind of hurt me there and that's the default in that template. I should have been able to maybe block that connection uh, out of the gate. Uh, we've also got the CloudFront distribution that was forwarding traffic into the vulnerable OWASP application was missing an origin access identity which means I could skirt around CloudFront and the WAF and connect directly to the instance which bypasses all of the security features. So that's the postmortem side. That's what I learned just by digging around in the dashboard, looking through the log files, summarizing this very quickly here, and we'll wrap it up. I know we've got a couple of minutes left. Uh, doing the exercise as a whole, does anybody do this internally at their organization? I, I would highly recommend it. On a Friday afternoon, get some devs, get some ops folks, get some engineers, get some security folks all in the room and just play this game and do the postmortem together. Because we identified just in an hour a whole bunch of different places that were missing monitoring and security that you would not want to really be finding for the first time as you're being attacked. So playing the game can help you build your defenses out. That'd be my number one takeaway. Take uh, code reviews, obviously someone reviewing that WordPress app would have easily seen those creds in a config file. So basic linting and scanning and get hooks to block secrets from being committed to your repos probably would be a good thing that, that we could do in that situation. Uh, the honeypot endpoints are awesome. I will say that was my one big win from the whole thing is that I did block the room out. So that's kind of the conclusion side. I will, how much, do we have a couple minutes or are we pretty much at that point, contact info. Uh, I'll open it up for questions at this point for anybody that any other thoughts you can think of on the defense or monitoring side that would be kind of fun there? So this is going to, I mean, this monitoring and everything you've talked about, that's going to stop the obvious attack. Somebody who's coming in doing a smash and grab, grabbing things. It's not going to stop those who are, okay, I'm going to go slowly under the radar type stuff. Absolutely. It's a good point. So 
Yes, the comment is this is going to prevent a lot of the automated kind of brute force smash and grab style attacks. Those are just going to be eliminated right out of the gate. A real attacker that really wants to compromise your stuff, they're probably going to go the manual route and not use a lot of automation. And hopefully we've got other logging and event triggers if they do get into something that catch that. But yeah, absolutely. This is the script kitty detection. As I always say, hopefully the goal, honestly, is to frustrate the attacker that they can't run automations and they just go attack Equifax instead of your company. That's the end goal. Is there another? <laughs> That's awesome. So yeah, OK Cupid for those listening later uh, has a, a scenario where they detect a bot and they just move them off into a different environment and, and let the bots talk to the other bots. That's pretty. That's pretty awesome. It's kind of it's like the Ticketmaster thing. You can get very creative with these techniques, and that's that's the fun stuff. That's where this gets really exciting. Any other questions? Yeah. Right, good. That's a great question. What's what are the options when you've got a sim on prem and then you've got all this cloud data? Uh, it's difficult to. A lot of people end up in a hybrid mode, depending on your cloud contract, because the cloud providers love to charge you tons and tons of money to extract all of that log data back into your on prem system. Another problem is if you have an on prem system that you know maybe charges you based on the volume of information that you drop into it. The cloud data can be very noisy, so a lot of folks have trouble filtering that down to relevant events and putting it in the on-prem sim just from a, co a costing perspective. So if you've got deep pockets, you can put it all in your on-prem sim and just continually be syncing that information up. That's completely doable, but it can be costly. Some folks choose to just keep them separate and keep the data within the cloud to avoid those, those charges. Um, from an architecture pattern, I'd be a fan of having it in one centralized system if you could do it, but not always an option for, for everybody. All right, I think we're about out of time, so sorry guys, I didn't catch you up any on our schedule here. I'll have to pass that burden on to the next speaker. <laughs> all right, thanks all.